All right, we'll go ahead and get started with this session intro then. And then um, those of you that are just joining us, welcome. This is the Igniting Ed, ed Tech. Um, we're creating impact through research and enterprise startups. So my name is Ryan Irvin. I'm a PhD student in the Faculty of Education. And I'm studying with Rupert Wegerf, my supervisor. And so today's program is produced by the Digital Education Futures Initiative, also known as DEFI. And it's part of the research bridge at Hughes Hall in Cambridge. So DEFI exists to creatively explore the possibilities that digital technology opens up for education. And you'll hear more about DEFI in just a few moments from our director, Professor Rupert, Rupert Wegerf. <laughs> Oh, do you want me to take over, Ryan? Thanks very no. much. No? <laughs> um, yeah, so I'll just give a quick reminder about, you can download the participant list. So it'll be in the chat box there. Barry is gonna be sharing it for us. And also I wanna direct you to the question and answer button for questions. And then if you'd like to use the chat box for reflections and for networking, then we'll help everyone get connected afterwards. So yep, there's the registrant list now. But yeah, thank you for those of you who submitted questions in advance. So we look forward to many more questions. And then I'll introduce um, my two colleagues and myself. So I said, I'm a PhD student at the Faculty of Education. I'm studying online learning at the moment with a um, eighth grade class in California. So um, Pablo Torres is an educational and developmental psychologist and he specializes in the school years. His research is fo focused on the relationship between social interactions. So pedagogy, collaboration and play with educational technology and human development, as well as a motivation for learning. He's currently a British Academy postdoctoral fellow and the convener of the DEFI Research Network. And he's focusing on the study and theorization of educational technology for learning. So Pablo teaches and supervises both undergraduate and postgraduate students at the Faculty of Education here at the University of Cambridge. Then we've got um, Professor Rupert Wegriff, and he's a member of the Faculty of Education at the University of Cambridge. He's also the director of DEFI at Hughes Hall, and he's on the steering group of the Cambridge Educational Dialogue Research Group and co-convener of the Argumentation, Reason, and Dialogue Special Interest Group. And he's also part of the European Association of Research on Learning and Instruction, and he's received numerous large grants and is highly cited for his books and articles researching the use of technology in education and developing a new theory of education for the internet age. So now I'll invite Rupert to say a bit more about DEFI and how you can get involved. All right, so this, this is particular event organized by, by Ryan and, and uh, Pablo and uh, Zuber, I think, uh, Zuber involved. It's certainly, it's on our enterprise strand and it's wonderful to see it happening. But I just want, thought we might say a little bit more about DEFI, the Digital Education Futures Initiative here, based at Hughes Hall, Cambridge, but it's a Cambridge-wide initiative. One of the things we want to do is unite all the exciting research in this area, exploring the future possibilities of education that's going on in and around Cambridge. So I think Pablo is heading up our research network university-wide. Do find out more about that. Look at our, our Twitter and our website. But also we want to be a, a global hub that to some extent can serve as a catalyst for change in education. Uh, education is changing whether people want it to or not with digitalization. And I think there are better or worse ways of doing that. And we'd like to explore the best ways to be able to advise policymakers and industry and academia. So do stay in touch. We've got 1,200 um, people already connected to us globally. We're organizing monthly seminars, webinars by Barry. Um, so there's lots going on. One of our biggest projects at the moment, just to let you know, very um, significant for the faculty, I hope, CamTree is trying to provide a global platform where teachers can learn from their own close to practice research and can share it and develop the best ways forward. One of the things we'd love to do is explore in more detail a kind of open school project, which would provide educational possibilities for any child anywhere in the world. So uh, we're looking for, for more support and more funding. Do join us, get involved. Um, I'll now hand over to my colleagues to tell you more about this event. Who's, who's next on our, on, our, on our talking list? Get it back to you, Ryan. I believe that would be me now, Rupert. Thank you. Oh, Kevin, I should introduce yeah. our exciting new manager of DEFI. We're delighted that Kevin has started in January 
And uh, although I'm, I'm the director, um, I really uh, depend on his manage management skills. He's now taking Defi forward. So over to you, Kevin. Thank you, Rupert. And a warm welcome to all of our guests from around the world. As Rupert said, my name is Kevin Martin, the Center Manager for DEFI. The first session this evening is entitled Banjos and Dojos, Inspiring the Next Generation of Learners. We are joined by an inspirational group of panelists, all of whom have used an entrepreneurial mindset to develop creative ways to engage the next generation of learners. I'm sure that their stories will be an encouragement for all of you attending today. And should you have a question for our panelists, please direct them to the chat box. When the three panelists have concluded speaking, I will then facilitate a question and answer session. Our first panelist today is James Welton. James is an entrepreneur and software developer from Ireland. In 2011, at age 18, he co-founded Coder Dojo, a movement of over 2,300 free coding clubs for young people across over 110 countries. James has worked in CTO and private equity roles across the Middle East, Japan, and the USA. Currently, James is building Conjure.so, a platform for behavior change and achievement, and is co-founder and CTO of TokyoMate.jp. James is passionate about self-development and well-being, having tested every method possible to burn himself out. So with that, James, the floor is yours, and thank you for your time today. All right, thank you. So I'm going to share my screen and hopefully this goes well. Uh, all right. So I believe you can all see those slides, can you? Excellent, all right. Uh, it's all downhill for it. So my name is James Welton. I'm co-founder of an organization called Coder Dojo and founder of a platform called Conjure. What I'm gonna talk about today um, is, and I better start my timer, is a brief overview of Kodorojo and Conjure, why and how Kodorojo started, and for anybody who's interested in trying something out, be that big or small. And my aim is really just to encourage you by showing you how low the bar is to doing something. Um, so Kodorojo is a global movement of free programming clubs for young people, all volunteer run, targeting young people aged seven to 17. Uh, I also don't know if my internet just cut out. I hope not. Uh, I don't know. Oh, there we go. I think we're back. Nope, internet didn't cut out. No lag. I better just check the uh, internet issue. Oh, just carry on, James. That was a very brief interruption. The... Oh, now it's good. Yeah. <laughs> okay. There we go. Okay. So uh, just let me know if there's any issues and I can repeat myself. But Coder Rojo, Global Women to Free Programming Clubs for Young People, Found in 2011, it's yeah, now in uh, uh, over 115 countries and uh, 2,400 clubs. Basically, it's got a very particular culture to it. Uh, we try and keep it far away from the classroom environment. Uh, they're club oriented. It's a very fun and friendly and informal environment. We aim to be inclusive and open and focus not just on teaching coding, but then also team working, uh, socializing, presenting skills. Um, and uh, I guess from a uh, an approach we focus a lot on project-based learning, uh, self-led learning, uh, peer, peer mentoring. Um, and our foundation in 2017 merged with the Raspberry Pi Foundation. So we're all one big happy family. Uh, my more recent baby is uh, Conjure, which is a behavior management and achievement platform. Uh, basically, it's, uh, it's kind of come about as a result of my own life experiences and research into subjective well-being and life satisfaction and every other term that will uh, try and make me rank high on Google. Um, and that's been 17 months of development and so long bootstrap. It has some paying customers. I'm still kind of not letting too many people in as I'm getting the primitives right. But there I'm really optimizing for value creation and experimentation over revenue. And the jury is still out if it has any value for people, but there's people who've used it every day for the last nine months. So that definitely made the uh, conversations at a Christmas dinner with my parents a bit easier. Um, so uh, why Coderojo just started? Uh, I made my first website when I was nine years old. And I really fell in love with coding. But what was incredibly frustrating was that there was nowhere to learn, to get recognition for this thing that I cared about, or to meet people who had similar interests. And academically, I was quite poor. I had a different learning style, or if you ask my dad, I had no learning style. But I continued to uh, self-teach and explore this. And it wasn't that I was particularly smart. I just grinded away and put in the hours. And I didn't mind doing that because I loved it. Uh, and that's like another way of saying that, like, 
it might have taken me like three or four weeks longer to get like an image to show on a web page than other people. Um, and I dropped in on some university lectures, but I found that they didn't resonate either maybe due to the, I guess, the instructional style or, uh, you know, building a mortgage calculator for your first web app didn't particularly resonate with the, with the teenage me. Um, so I continued self-teaching and in my final year of high school, I won a website competition. And at that competition, I won an iPod Nano. I found an exploit that I didn't think was particularly impressive. I could get it to do some things it wasn't supposed to do, post that in line. And then I had my 15 minutes of internet fame from kind of fellow Apple fanboys who were interested in it. Um, and then people in my school heard about this and they were like, well, if that idiot Welton can code, surely we can too. So they asked me how to uh, code and, uh, I started a computer club and twice a week after school, I started teaching about 40 students. And we tried to keep it, uh, it's a very different environment to a classroom because we had that all day. So it's very relaxed. Um, we just focus on having fun. If you didn't know what you wanted to build, we'd have like a competition who could make the worst website and, and things like that. Uh, and soon students from other schools wanted to attend seeing what like members of our club were, were making these of like games and websites and so on. Um, so, uh, I was invited to, still in my final year of secondary school, invited to speak at a, a conference about the hacking experience, my, my precious minutes of internet fame. Uh, I mentioned this, this school club. I met Bill, who would go on to become my co-founder, who also lived in Cork, had a technology background. And he saw the economic need and opportunity for coders, which, which I hadn't seen at the time when I was in secondary school. I was very much so about how meaningful it was to me to, to make things and build things. And he felt that we could run one of these clubs outside of school, which was kind of pertinent because I was leaving school soon and people were wondering what was going to happen to this club. So we didn't really have any master plan or great vision. We said, let's just do a one-off club and see what happens. So we got an empty office space. We contacted anyone who uh, contacted me and we waited to see if people would show up and, and they did. And fortunately they loved it. We built you know websites in their, in their first session. Some people even traveled three hours down from, from Dublin um, and they said, see you next weekend. So we know we'd no master plan in building it. Um, and once people had seen what we'd done, they wanted to start their own clubs and asked how they, uh, how we did it. Um, and we iterated as we went. So as we encountered new learnings and data points and, and different scenarios, we kind of refined the model on how we operate these clubs. Uh, we kind of continue to refine and articulate these values and, and pedagogy. So I think me at, me at the time, you know, education or, or Pedagogy wasn't on the forefront of my mind, but um, I think then we were fined on like self-led learning, it being a lot more powerful if a young person can learn to Google these things for themselves or peer-led learning if they can ask each other and then kind of came up with concepts like uh, ask three, then me, where you have to ask Google, then the person to your left, then to your right, and then you can ask a mentor. Um, and a lot of this was tacit knowledge, either, either things that I'd done in my childhood self-teaching or that once we just done it to enough kids, we kind of saw a common denominator and then could verbalize and, and articulate what some of these patterns were. We also kept it very chill and low pressure. Um, we were delighted to find out if, if young people hated coding because then we'd probably save them a, a lot of heartache at third level. Um, and once we had a common vision and values and articulated that, our community grew kind of exponentially because people could relate to it and identify with it. And then would contribute back their learnings, the resources they had developed further defining Coderojo. Um, so, I mean, to kind of then maybe talk about why you do things and, and, and driving it and I guess having the, uh, the difference, I guess, uh, this was kind of one big learning for me, but uh, I like Coderojo from 18 to 21. At age 21, we had a foundation with several people working there and a few hundred clubs, but the foundation needed uh, somebody with governance skills who could find KPIs, strategy, and, and define success for people and help them attain it, which I did not have. And then I was also quite burnt out because I wasn't looking after myself came quite depressed and anxious. Um, so I also want to get back to coding and also try out capitalism because I heard with capitalism, you could actually afford things. So uh, we hired a new CEO and I went and uh, for a few years after then was in the Middle East and, and took different CTO roles. Um, and that was quite self-actualizing as a, as a software developer and, and kind of plugged those skills gaps. But after some challenging uh, situations and kind of really pursuing carrots and sticks, I, I reflected how and why I work on things. And that was too attached to the outcome um, in trying to, probably too materialistic, trying to like achieve some outcome. Um, so, which is quite opposite to the, to the Coder Ojo days and what my drive was there because we were, I was doing it for the love of doing it or, or following, uh, like the activity was the reward. So uh, long story short, I had the existential crisis, knew I wanted to build something um, and tried to reframe why I would go about and, and, and do something um, and kind of settle on a few heuristics. which mostly came down to that, I enjoyed doing it for myself. I was willing to work in it for two years with no external validation. 
the activity was a reward. Even if it wasn't successful, the learnings that I would take from it, I'd carry with, uh, with me for my life because that space would be vocational for me. Um, and if I had all the resources, would I do it anyway? Um, and it still took a year after that to uh, continue researching, experimenting before I had the conviction to work on Conjure Now uh, for the last, uh, with those parameters. And, and that's been 17 months of, uh, let me put it to you this way. It was either get a mortgage or build an app. And you know which one I took much to the heart of my parents. Um, so I think to uh, come to the learnings about all that, um, the... With respect to, to Coder Ojo, and, and again, like I started this at 18, so there wasn't a, I don't think that I had an awareness of maybe uh, what third level education looked like, or, or probably too much awareness of like traditional education structures other than my like firsthand experience being in secondary school, my, my personal experience, trying to learn as a young person coding in Cork, Ireland, which wasn't the technology center of the universe. But uh, me starting Coder Ojo was actually survivorship bias or a result of statistics or a fluke. I happened to be a person who had that experience. Uh, I happened to come of age around technology hitting more prevalence and the social network becoming a popular film and, and some other factors. Um, I think that the, uh, I think then going around a second time and trying to start something more mindful uh, with Conjure it took a lot of uh, research and experimentation over, over a few years. So Kodoro, I just I had kind of passively gained this knowledge and insight. But then after when trying to start something else, I was like, am I a one-trick pony? Can I do something else again? And it really highlighted the difference that if I was going to do something and make an impact, I actually had to have hours and experience and insight. And I'd kind of been a bit oblivious to how I attained that previously. So I, I've got a much more appreciation for um, effort and, and uh, being mindful and uh, with effort. Um, Every situation is unique. So with Coderojo, we just rapidly tried things. The stakes were low. We were willing to fail. We'd acquire data points. It was very cheap to course correct and iterate. Um, we also kind of had the idea that everything that we'd started was, uh, we'd be, th every idea that we had, whether it was good or bad, we knew it was a starting point. So we were totally happy to, to end up three or four degrees away from that original idea where we started. Um, with Coderojo, we didn't have a foundation or any structure for the first year. Um, I think to us, bureaucracy was a known known. We knew that there would be a lot of overhead and creating a charity and creating an entity. Um, so rather we would just have organizations who donate their space informally or people volunteer informally or a bunch of other things. Um, so in our eyes, bureaucracy is a known known. You know that there's gonna be time there and effort there. Value creation is a known unknown and that you know you want to create value. You just don't know how you're gonna get there. And the journey is an unknown unknown and that you don't know what the journey to get to creating value is. So we definitely optimize for the, the value creation and journey um, component because the bureaucracy we knew would come and, and what that would look like. Um, uh, the other thing I, I think in experimenting and how we refine some of our styles of teaching and the environment of Kodoroju and how we made that a more scalable model and our resources was um, we kind of felt that, well, or I've learned that one out of five things will work. So we just tried to fail through the other four things as, as fast as possible and set ourselves up that if we if we did fail, that it was low consequence and we factored in the model. Um, and I think in, in doing uh, Kodorojo and then now Conjure again and my time in the Middle East and elsewhere and every other get rich quick scheme that I participated in, uh, I know that there's gonna be a lot of failure, rejection and looking stupid. So the only way that I've managed to face that is, is de-risk that with uh, expectation management and, and mental framing that that's okay, that that's learning and progression. So quite an experimental mindset. Because um, on our personal front that I, I do know that uh, something new or experimenting can, uh, can be daunting. Um, and I think the final thing is somebody who, like I, I didn't end up going to, to college myself. So again, I further lacking insight on maybe traditional education structures. But the learning was that there is, is no right path um, or no one right path, only the path that you take and, and that works for you. And that's something that I tried to keep in mind that when I didn't know if what we were doing with Kodoroja was right or wrong or even what I do today. I just try and find the path that works for us. Um, so I think that that's everything on my side. And I've come just in time. Uh, hopefully the uh, diary hasn't sent me any, uh, uh, any, any cruel messages. I think I've done okay on timing. <laughs> um, I think I pass on to uh, somebody else now. That was great, thank you, James, and you were perfect on timing. <laughs> uh, so our next panelist this evening is Adina Fajardo, who is originally from Mexico. She is passionate about education and how it can improve our society by integrating technology, research, and educational practice. 
She's a PhD candidate at the Faculty of Education, researching the use of play-based learning in Mexican schools. In addition, she collaborates with DEFI in several research projects. She is co-founder of Dexterity Club, an organization committed to supporting teachers, caregivers, and children in developing their digital skills. So thank you, Dina, and the Zoom room is yours. Um, thank you. Let me share my screen. Yeah. Um, yeah, so hi, everyone. I am Dina, and I'm co-founder of the Dexterity Club. Um, as it says there, and I hope you're looking at my screen, uh, it all began in 2020. Just uh, we recently were hit by the pandemic, and Tere, my co-founder, my colleague, and very dear friend, and I were thinking about what to do to put our passion for education and also technology into the world service. Uh, we started thinking on what we could offer to the people that could be valuable and at the same time solve a specific problem. Uh, asking around and also doing our own uh, research, we found statistics that um, for sure um, you know that maybe in, in 2030 or perhaps earlier, 90% of the entire world population will be connected to the internet, that in only four years, 133 million jobs will be created in the area of technology and innovation, and how obviously the COVID pandemic accelerated all this, and we were relying or we are relying on tech for communicating, working, playing, studying. So in this scenario, we thought it was a very good moment to start, to start our own effort to help children develop their digital skills. Um, and we found, obviously we found many different efforts that were already uh, being out there, such as Color Doyo. We um, learned about them and about, about how they were doing in the city where we are. And, uh, but we still started small workshops and courses on coding, robotics, video games design, web design, among others. However, as we learn more on the topic, we encountered, encountered other kind of realities, such as that women represent only 30% of the workforce in the STEM areas. Still more than 80% of the population in the low and middle income countries are not connected to the internet. And that today's children are the first generation, generation growing up with access to the digital world. So we understood that we wanted to go further on our approach. Yes, developing coding skills and learning how to code is very important. And as James has explained with their reach in Coder Dojo, but we thought that we wanted to complement what is already out there, such as uh, them and other organizations to go further on helping people develop their digital and tech skills. So uh, we start doing our research and who is doing this? And we got very inspired on the DQ Institute who have been showing that digital skills go beyond learning, learning how to use technology, but also how to be a proper citizen in the digital world, know how to use and create tech for good and use it for bigger goals. Um, so we expanded our mission and we want to offer innovative resources to encourage children, caregivers and teachers active and responsible participation in the digital transformation with a special emphasis on those affected by the digital divide. Um, so to achieve, to achieve this mission, we have the goal of supporting children to become creators instead um, of just users of technology. Help them, help them develop, develop their digital citizenship skills to become more responsible, employable, and tolerant future citizens. Uh, motivate girls. This was a very important uh, topic in, in our own uh, organization because we are both women and we thought that uh, with our um, encouragement, we could motivate girls to participate in the STEM, STEM areas and provide tools also to caregivers and teachers. It, most importantly, because we thought that we, we needed, we need them to join their children's digital competencies development. So uh, how we do this? We are creating a global tech community in which through different activities, we connect companies, STEM leaders, universities, NGOs with the children, the caregivers and the schools. Um, we are currently physical in the Netherlands and through our virtual activities, we've reached people in the UK, Spain and Mexico. And we are looking to extend our reach by growing our community. Um, we think that STEM leaders, companies, universities are 
the best role models for children to understand how they can use technology and create technology for good, uh, but also become really a digital citizens. So how to handle through uh, their own network, uh, how, how to handle um, this, uh, the, the new digital world, that, the duplicate world that we are living now, in which we are living now. So we are slowly growing up to achieve these goals and learning from the pandemic, but also from the connectedness that we have now to create this tech community that can benefit and move our world forward. So that's about me and our dexterity. Um, yeah. Thank you, Dina, for sharing. And I would like to remind all of our guests here tonight that if you have a question, please put it in the chat box and we will um, ask them during the question and answer session after our final panelist, who is Kate Boyle. Originally from London, Kate graduated in English literature and moved to Los Angeles, where she worked in the literary department of the William Morris Agency, now WME, and later as a story editor and creative executive on Ghostbusters 3 for Ivan Reitman at Sony, Men in Black 3 for Amy Pascal at Sony, Museum of Supernatural History for Steven Spielberg at DreamWorks, and additional projects at Paramount, Universal, and Disney. Her passion for storytelling, the written word, animals, and travel led naturally to the creation of a globe-trotting cat who sends letters to loved ones. So Kate, thank you for your time tonight, and we are eager to hear about this globe-trotting cat. Thanks very much, Kevin. I'll share my screen. Let me know if you can see a happy looking child. Can you? Is that good? Okay, great. <laughs> okay, great. Let me start my timer. Great. Um, hi, thanks very much. I'm, I'm Kate. I'm the founder of Banjo Robinson. Um, I, I guess uh, a good place to start. <clears throat> given the nature of this talk is, is sort of the idea, um, the genesis of, of what eventually, eventually became Banjo Robinson. So when I was growing up, my, my dad would leave letters um, and notes around the house for me to find, and I absolutely loved them, so much so that when I was um, an adult, I started sending letters to my friend's children and um, I signed them off with a, a, a paw print um, and I pretended to be a cat called originally Smash Robinson. Um, and the funniest thing started to happen. Children, my friends' children, started to write back to the cat. Um, and then their parents would ask me to continue writing. And I, I was sort of wondering why um, I was able to get them writing when I had barely met them. I was living in Los Angeles. Um, but their parents were really struggling. Um, and I think the reason they were writing back to this uh, early prototype character called Banjo was that children are wired for connection and they love magic and make-believe. And I, I thought... Uh, that this was an opportunity to fundamentally change the way that we teach children to read and write um, and learn about the world, um, to, train, to turn the process into a game and, and appeal to what they want to do, which is play. Um, so that's what we're doing at Banjo Robinson. So um, Banjo Robinson is uh, a magical globe-trotting cat who travels around the world and he sends um, digital content and physical content, letters and creative activities to children from different countries around the world. He might one week be in uh, India, he might be at the Taj Mahal or the Great Wall of China, he might be going to Indonesia or Iceland, and everywhere he goes he sends a letter from um, his travels. Um, these are his cat cousins from around the world, Banjo's the little orange cat in the middle. Um, and essentially what we've, um, what was originally just me writing some letters to my friends' children back home in London, um, has evolved into a brand which gamifies reading and writing, makes it really fun for children, and we all know how important um, that home learning and early classroom uh, time is for children. If you get it right then, a lot of other things take care of themselves. Uh, children are more likely to read uh, Harry Potter, put their hand up in class, ask questions, uh, read Jane, Dick Jane Austen, Charles Dickens, go to university, less likely to go to jail. And so um, all sorts of great things come from a really strong foundation in literacy. Um, and that's, what we, uh, that's where our sort of focus is as a company with lots of different touch points. So the first touch point that we have is um, a direct-to-consumer subscription product, which is a, a combination of physical and digital. The physical gets us amazing engagement. These children receive a personalized letter 
from a, a cat, um, recipes from around the world, uh, stickers and a map and puzzles and country facts and coloring in activities and reply stationery. Um, and they get this in the post every two weeks from different countries, but they also get digital content, free printables, um, things that their parents can print off um, and just access easily, uh, very cheap for us to make. Um, and I guess from the child's point of view, it's real letters from a magical cat. From um, the parent's point of view, it's personalized literature um, disguised as letters or a literary subscription. Um, which also teaches children about the world. Um, in terms of literacy, books encourage reading, but there's nothing amazingly on the market that prompts children to write a reply, like a letter. Um, and they do this in droves. So nine children out of 10, a phenomenal number that we're really proud of, will write back to Banjo, age five to eight. Um, that was a mum's net study of 500 families that we did independently. Um, and we're also, um, apart from getting children to write, we're also really low cost, curriculum aligned, multidisciplinary learning that doesn't feel like learning. Um, so we cover everything from geography, history, language, culture, and all that really important post COVID um, growth mindset stuff, resilience, kindness, practice, um, sharing, um, and all the soft skills that are really important um, around children's mental health as well. Um, so the way it works, um, people sign up, or parents will sign up, they'll give us some personalization data points. So the letters when they arrive will be peppered with um, uh, personalization elements. So we might know if you have a golden retriever called Charlie and we um, will mention him, Banjo will be friends with him and reference him in the letters. Children receive a big map of the world, stickers um, to travel around and follow Banjo's journeys. Um, it also works as a, a point of conversation for um, the, the brand in the home. Um, and for the family. Um, and then children write back to Banjo. Um, they might ask, um, uh, it's a bit like the tooth fairy, so they'll, they'll write a letter back to Banjo and they'll leave it underneath the sofa before they go to bed. So just like the tooth fairy, overnight it gets collected and they'll be really excited in the morning when our product is no longer there. <laughs> um, parents collect it overnight, of course, and this whole process is completely automated and scalable. We don't receive any letters back from children. Parents keep them. Um, as a memento of their children's early writing. Um, but the children always ask questions. That's the thing about this brand is that because it exists in the magic make-believe space, which was a happy accident, I didn't set out for that to be what we do that's so different than everyone else in children's IP, but that really is the thing. You know, they, they have a friendship, they have a relationship with this character. They, they believe he's real. They, you know, they know that he's friends with their dog, that he, you know, they might write a letter and say, I got a gold star in gymnastics last week. Here's a picture of a penguin. What's your favorite color? And then the next week, um, using our platform, parents can go on to, um, they can log into their account and they can add their own message to the end of the next letter that the child receives. So this can be done physically or digitally, but, um, you know, essentially you'll get a letter from Mexico and there'll be a PS written by the parent, which says, um, by the way, I loved your picture of a penguin. Congratulations on your gold star in gymnastics. I heard that your, that child got the tennis ball stuck under the shed last week uh, your nanny broke her foot and has been hobbling around the house in a cast and these children just cannot believe how can't work out how banjo could know this and they completely believe in this character um what that does apart from making me smile and everyone at banjo smile and being a really lovely element of this company um is it's really important product feedback loop for us so it informs the content that we then send out digitally through our newsletters the weekly meow and the friday feline um, it uh, helps us to get better um, and uh, it's scalable, it's a reciprocal back and forth. So instead of writing to Father Christmas once in December, you're, you're writing back and forth to Banjo throughout the year. It's also a super engagement, both the children and the parents really, really engaged in this product. Um, and and uh, it's also parent sentiment data that is another revenue stream. So really important part of the product. But essentially, we're working with the same children's authors that you might work with um, at HarperCollins, developing um, content over a year. But instead of doing that, we sit with the same best-selling authors that are on your bookshelves at home. We write a short letter with them on a Wednesday and we print it on 2,000 pieces of A4 paper the following Thursday. So no long development times, no binding, no working with third-party distributors trying to shift 20,000 units of, of stock. Um, it's a positive cash conversion cycle. Um, we don't print anything until we're paid and zero inventory, which um, is uh, another really nice element about this. But essentially, it's Father Christmas merged with subscription. Um, and that's the that's the, the 
consumer product. Our school product is um, just a classroom version of the home product, but a little bit more of just a taster. So instead of going to 42 countries around the world with supplemental digital material interspersed between those stops, um, they go to three countries in the classroom. The letters are personalized by their teacher. Everything is um, it's all digital, so parents, uh, teachers receive this for free. We've already developed it um, in consultation with teachers, teachers, Ofsted advisors. They get class lesson plans, um, three letters that they can personalize, activities. Children write back to Banjo, leave their letters underneath the teacher's desk. They get really excited when they come back from break and it's not there anymore. And they go home with a certificate, like a I traveled the world with Banjo Robinson air ticket with an offer which their parent can redeem for the subscription program. So it's uh, for the consumer cons subscription. Um, so we did this because we found out that, um, you know, in anything, it doesn't matter if you've got a good idea or a good team um, or a big market, um, data is everything and um, needs to be forefront in your mind <laughs> if you ever start a business. By the way, never start a business, it's really stressful. <laughs> um, but if you're going to, uh, we found out that um, while there are, I think, 2% of the UK population are teachers, um, I hope my data is right, I'm realizing I'm talking to a lot of educators here, 17% um, of our early adopters are teachers. So we knew that there was a disproportionately large amount of educators in our early adopters. We created this product for them. Um, the market was asking for it, so we did it. Um, and it's a really nice um, way for us to uh, achieve distribution for the other product and, and get Banjo into the hearts and minds of children. Um, this is what I was talking about, the sort of jumping up and down element. Um, if these are the four biggest children's brands in the world um, that aren't prioritizing literacy and, and uh, cultural learning and history and geography. Um, but this is the relationship that Banjo has with um, 350 families that we surveyed. Um, so, and absolutely, uh, this is what happens when you sort of strike gold and you have engagement. This is what it looks like. Um, this is the jumping up and down, Skyping my grandmother in Australia because a cat started writing to me, staying up late, writing to Banjo, Valentine's cards, um, because uh, it's school tomorrow and you've got 15 to give out. Um, uh, forgetting all about the iPad um, because a letter's arrived from Banjo. And similarly, how close does your child feel to the following characters? Um, very high engagement. And then the third piece that um, the company has developed is um, we're developing a TV show which acts as a flywheel between the subscription product, um, which the engagement of which that sort of love of Banjo, the friendship that children feel for Banjo because he knows that they're moving house. They just have a baby brother who's about to arrive. They're moving school soon. They're worried about that. That relationship um, means that it de-risks a TV show. The TV show drives subscriptions. The subscription en that engagement drives uh, de-risks a TV show, and so on and so on. Um, this also has applications um, for English language learning. As we all know, lots of money spent on getting children to be proficient in English language um, by the end of their primary school education in Asia and Scandinavia, South America. And we've also been asked to do the foreign language co-edition, so the German version, the uh, Portuguese version, Polish and Italian so far. Um, although we're a small team, so we've had to had to um, focus our resources and um, we'd like to do that as soon as we can. Again, we're looking for partners if anyone would like to um, collaborate with us on, on any of those projects, we'd be really interested. Um, I think I've spoken about the ways that the model is different from our competitors. Um, essentially seven pieces of paper in an envelope that make children feel 10 feet tall, really special and help them um, uh, engage with writing in a way that associates it with fun. Um, lots of net revenue streams. Um, these are the sort of sectors we span, although we're more um, interactive uh, than all of them and our price point is much lower. Um, we sent 70,000 letters to children in 41 countries. We only advertise in the UK um, and we're really proud of the engagement stats. So it was the highest level of um, participation that Mumsnet have ever seen in a, in a product trial um, and we tested it with them. Uh, we're doing a raise. This is my funding deck, so apologies <laughs> again. Contact me if you'd like to help us um, and partner. But um, yeah, it's. I think the thing I'm most proud of is um, you know, we get reviews like this, children saying this is the best day of my life. Um, and uh, so, yes, it's, it's been quite satisfying, if, if uh, terrifying as a journey. <laughs> and we had a lot of help. So um, if anyone does want to take their idea and uh, put it into the world, I'm, I have a lot of karmic debt. So I'm very happy to um, drop me a line and I'll be helpful if I can be. Thank you, Kate, for sharing. That was really fascinating. And thank, thank you, you to all of our panelists for joining us tonight. You're welcome.
Um, our first question is a pre-submitted question and it's for all of the panelists. And it's reflective of the fact that we have a lot of researchers in the audience tonight. And they were wondering how you used research to support your idea and startup when you got started. So I think just to, my internet it cut out a little bit. So to repeat the question, it's, it's how you use research to, uh, in, when starting your idea. If I heard correctly. Yes, okay. that's right, James. Uh, yeah. Um, so that, yeah, again, as I said earlier, like first time was a total fluke. <laughs> so uh, uh, I, I didn't, but again, that's a survivorship bias, I think. Uh, but then uh, I think we kind of almost had like a feedback cycle or iteration cycle where we got learnings and that almost inherently worked as a research. But then later projects that I've done, um, I think that there's been like a, a vacuum of information at the beginning. So I've actually worked on getting a product out there first, just meet as a method to engage with people who are actually in the real world who would use it and then get the insights and learning. Um, so for sure that there's been like research that I've done and like other apps or other systems that are, are tangentially related and how they implement things. But uh, uh, I've often been in favor of building something first and using that as the uh, mechanism to engage stakeholders and then get the actual insights. I think in our case, we've been yeah, uh, trying to, to build up on uh, how we do things and where what we tailor or what our mission or goals are on, we are trying to build up on research as I was sh sharing with you guys, the DQ Institute has done a pretty long research on the digital skills that we have to develop. So we've tried to um, uh, build up uh, upon uh, other research that has been done out there. However, in practice, obviously, and I'm a, a research or I'm developing my own research skills myself, but I think in practice, it's it has to be a, a mix of, of both. So understand the research that, are, that is out there, how our research skills as persons in, uh, in, the, in the audience, other PhD students, how our research skills help us think of things differently, um, try out our, our own ideas, but also be a, a little bit practical as James was saying, like uh, on putting things out there, trying out with, with the people, with your own um, uh, stakeholders and, and move forward. Um, for me, uh, this is a conversation we have all the time because we have a, a team that's very data driven. And I mean, we started off, uh, I started writing letters myself and then very quickly we started testing them um, through partnerships with people like Mumsnet um, on families that I didn't know with no bias towards um, making me feel good about my um, writing. But as much as obviously data and, and um, customer insight has been a really crucial part of our development, I have to say, and this is probably an unpopular <laughs> um, position to take in academic circles, all the biggest mistakes we've made have been when I ignored my instinct. And by instinct, I don't mean um, like dreams I've had, although I do have weird dreams. Um, I mean more uh, the ton of information that you learn when you go on a journey like this, you just can't process it all. It's not all, there's too much. Um, and somewhere deep down, it gets collated, I imagine. And um, I call that my instinct. And every time I've, um, because, I, because I think there is a real, uh, an interesting push-pull between people who think that they are data-driven, but they're very biased in the, in the, in the uh, experiments and the hypotheses that they put together. So for example, we'll see tests that um, are rigorous in, their, in, in the way that they're executed, but um, the test itself, uh, we only had you know, resources, for example, one week to do one test rather than two, and the test that my instinct <laughs> said we should do didn't even get tested. So there's, a, there's always instinct involved, even in rigorous experimentation. And um, I uh, would just, um, I probably sound like such a, I, I, I just wanted to sort of caution that as much as that is a big part of our success, um, for me, ignoring your instinct as the founder who gets the most data across her desk, um, as anyone in the business, uh, that has been, um, that's been a big learning for me. I have a follow-up question for all of you. Kate, you just talked about this entrepreneurial journey that you went on, and James, you alluded to the various iterations that you went through when you 
started both of your projects. So I'm curious, how does the, the project or the product that you have today differ from the idea that you originally started with? Go first, Kate. Okay, so I mean, I really agree with James' point about James's point about um, you know it's really just a starting point. It's going to always inevitably bear absolutely no relation to the first idea that you have, um, and um, but that's a good thing. It's like art. You you start with an idea in mind, and then um, the thing that makes it yours is is all the sort of happy accidents that come. I think that that um, you got to be flexible and um, constantly learning and you are getting feedback all the time. Um, as a founder, I'm getting feedback from investors. You know, I remember in the early stages, investors would say, oh, it's great. You've got a, a positive cash conversion cycle. That's great. And I had no idea what that was. And I was like, great, wrote it down. And then the next investment meeting I had, I would go out and, and say that. And, and my whole pitch is comprised of, uh, of things that other people have taught me. So you've got to be, um, uh, sorry, I don't know if I've gone off track, but uh, you, you you are constantly taking feedback and if you're good at your job you're um, optimizing um, as fast as you're getting um, reliable feedback and um, so yeah we've gone down a, a we've done a uh, we're now a, a we're now a children's ip rather than an ed tech a subscription business um, and that wasn't something i envisaged at the beginning um, okay i think with the, with Roger, there, there was like a uh... Kind of, I'd say more so an evolution than a dramatic pivot at any stage. I mean, you have cases, I know the tech world of, of drastic pivots, like uh, uh, Slack began as a, uh, as a game uh, called Glitch. And then they actually, that totally failed, but the internal chat tool that they built was actually the thing that, that had traction. Um, whereas in the likes of Kodorojo, when we opened it up to the community and we had a lot more, let's say, use cases or people's experiences, one thing that came out of it was a, a thing called Coolest Projects, which is a, a large, um, I guess like science fair for Kodorojo participants where they get together in a convention center. There's a few thousand of them. They show off their projects that they're working from. That actually turned out to be quite a, a critical thing, uh, an important milestone for young people that they could have a, a project that they work to or a day that they could work to all year in, in building their, their projects and coding. Um, and then we, we introduced other concepts like, uh, like badges and belts at one point, which some clubs adopted. But uh, from our original place of just having like experimenting with one club and doing it outside and seeing what would happen to kind of organically letting it evolve. There was a, uh, I, I wouldn't say it was so much like as a several degrees removed or, or drastic, uh, drastic shift, but like a willingness. Um, uh, and as, as Kate said, like a flexibility for things to evolve and, and find their natural place. And just to finish it, and in our case, we started thinking only on children. So we were very focused on doing things for children. And we discovered that children were really uh, covered up. So there are tons of things that children can do online by themselves or with uh, at school, etc. And we found that this connection with uh, parents and teachers being together on the development of children in this new digital world was uh, still an open gap. So there are many questions from teachers and there are many questions from caregivers on how to encourage their children if they are not tech savvy themselves. So we wanted to uh, combine this and 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 so we we started we started shifting and incorporating uh, different goals on on our on our own mission. Thank you all for sharing your stories. Unfortunately, that is all the time we have for questions for uh, James, Kate, and Dina this evening. Um, Kate, if you do have a moment, if you could go to the Q&A box, there are a couple of pointed questions for you and Banjo Robinson, and other questions we can take offline. But again, thank you all for joining us tonight. We really appreciate it. And now I will hand off to Ryan, who will facilitate our next session. Thank you, Kevin, and thanks, James, um, Dina, and Kate for your presentations and for answering some questions. So we're going to be going into session B on local impact. First, we're going to have Sarah Minty and then Adam Woodage. So I want to do Sarah first. She, Sarah Minty founded the Developing Experts in October of 2015, and the company has since won the government-backed Tech Nation Rising Stars competition and been listed in J.P. Morgan's top 200 female-powered businesses. Prior to developing experts, Sarah was the CEO for Open Youth Trust Limited in Norwich, 
and a board member and a, on the chair for the National My Place, which is a tech platform operated on behalf of the Department of Education. I'm a founding curriculum designer for Inspiration Trust, as well as a long-serving teacher where her passion for science learning commenced. In 2020, Sarah was awarded an MBE for services to education and the tech industry. And I will let Sarah tell you more. Sorry, Hi, can you hear me? Uh, there you are, thank okay. you. <laughs> Sorry about that. You'd never guess I run a tech company. Um, it, thank you very much for the speakers for the first session. I found it really uh, fascinating, actually. Um, back in 2015, I was re researching the jobs market in Great Yarmouth and found that for every hairdressing vacancy that existed, there was um, uh, 10 kids qualified. And yet for every level two engineering post, a post worth three times the starting salary, there wasn't a single local young person that had the qualification that they needed in order to access that opportunity. I was a head teacher at the time, uh, trying to set up a free school. And I realized at that point, there's a real disconnect between what's being taught in the classroom and what the needs are of a local economy. So what I wanted to do is actually join together or come up with a solution that joined together the silos that exist in society. And when I say silos, I mean governments, employers, training pathway providers, uh, parents, uh, pupils and students. And in order to solve that problem, what we did is actually create a, um, a science curriculum for children ages four to 16 years and a careers uh, platform for the whole family. And it's been a journey and a half. Um, I bootstrapped the whole thing from my front lounge and uh, within a two year period had got to the point where we had 11 schools signed up. Um, it was a slog because I had to build, the team had to build so much content. We've raised 1.8 million pound to date. Um, we probably won't raise any more money uh, because uh, we'll be fine on the cash front because we will be profitable this year, which is really exciting. The company this year actually, um, back in 2020, we actually made the product free to schools as part of uh, our ambition to support schools through COVID. We now have 6,000 schools in the UK and a further 500 schools in China, and that's a really growing market for us. But at the same time, we also won a contract with the rail industry. Um, Basically, what we've done is created a solution that really addresses the skills pipeline uh, for the future. To illustrate that, there are seven nuclear power stations in the UK currently. Six of those are open and operational, and one of those, Hinkley Point C, is currently under construction. If you look at the average age of the station manager for the plants that are open, we know that the next station power manager, based on their age profile of the existing uh, set of managers, is currently age seven and they're year four at school. So it means that we know where to place the message of nuclear within the curriculum and where to place it geographically. So we've now got to the point where we've got the rail industry, um, nuclear industry, the offshore wind council, the horticultural society, um, all as uh, industry partners wanting our solution. And we've just been uh, commissioned by Bayes to actually uh, produce uh, data for them because what our system will do is enable you to track future talent pipelines for the future. So if a child finds a lesson on soil fascinating, immediately they can see the training pathway that they need to take in order to actually become a soil scientist. Uh, they can see where to study to become a soil scientist, and then they can see the jobs in their area. What we're committed to doing is making sure the career choice is no longer left to chance. We want to connect local talent to local opportunity. And we're doing that through a, um, through a virtual 360 gamified library um, of careers. So you can actually tour around a load of different virtual environments. So this is one we've created for the rail industry. You can listen to a talking head find out what a typical day looks like for a particular role. And so each talking head answers a set of questions. And then as part of that, um, they can uh, then uh, answer a series of questions and it's all gamified. And so we've got clients and customers like Network Rail, 
where you can win prizes to actually turn up for a job interview. Uh, but it's all about building engagement and really making sure that, as I said, career choice is no longer left to chance. Over the next year, we'll be turning over around a million pounds without our China revenues. With China, um, our revenues will be around five, six million. Um, so our year end is end of August. Um, we're looking to exit in due course um, uh, once we've actually got those revenues consolidated. Uh, but it's been a journey and a half. And what some of the founders have said already, it's not an easy journey. I can concur. It's been the hardest journey I've ever experienced. The first four years, we um, didn't make any money. First two years, I wasn't paid. Um, literally, uh, I've still got debt. Uh, just to g give you context, um, the company owes me money because I, you know, just literally uh, put it first on every front. Um, before I started, I didn't have grey hair. I've got grey hair now. Um, I put it down to actually starting a business up. It must be down to that and it can't be possibly down to old age at all. Um, but that uh, is my my slot, I think. I think that's 10 minutes, Ryan. Um, but uh, happy to talk more if, if needed. <laughs> Great, thank you, Sarah. That'll, that'll leave more time for the, the questions at the end. And so we'll go on to our, our next speaker, Adam Woodage. He's currently studying at Hughes Hall in Cambridge. And prior to that, he was named the Buckinghamshire and Milton Keynes Young Leader of the Year in 2017, when he co-founded an AI-enhanced live tutoring solution to teach fluent English to millions of people in India. And he did that with a $500,000 seed round led by Peter Thiel's Emergent Ventures. And he's worked on the digital professional learning provisions for practitioners across 21 state schools in East Anglia. And that, that'll be the focus of this talk today. Go ahead, Adam. Thank you, Ryan. And, and thank you everyone for what were um, inspiring and, and really engaging talks. As, as Ryan said, I'm going to try and take a slightly different approach to the way that I think about this and not look at a journey as a co-founder um, in terms of the, the, the startup work in India, which we might come to later on, but actually take a different view of how we might implement some of this edtech stuff um, within institutions, in places where they can have a, a really strong impact immediately. Um, and so I'm going to speak anecdotally, I'm going to speak from my learnings, which have been biting off more than I can chew and learning to chew it and, and quite generally, including my computer falling down, which is an ideal. Um, from a, from a, can you still hear me okay? Fantastic, we'll pretend that didn't happen. Um, biting off more than I can chew and learning how to chew it um, and applying that within the state school sector in the UK. Um, and the brief with that is through part of the last year, I was working with a multi-academy trust, which is 21 schools. And the majority of them primary, but some secondary and special schools. And in response to the pandemic, and once that emergency phase was over, um, there, was, there was a want to think about the role that digital and digital education could play, not just in the student facing work at the school, but also in professional development too. Um, to give you some context, the, the, the trust very much has a strategy that the whole is greater than some of its parts, right? That by being a multi-academy trust and having these different schools, we should be able to share capacity between schools in order to improve uh, the practice of teachers, their development and education outcomes in the end. And we now had to reconceptualize how that looks in a world where people can't meet, but also where it might not be best for them to go together meeting. Um, for those of you who know rural East Anglia, um, you could know that, that in order to meet for some professional development meetings in a, in a local um, professional community, you might have to take a teacher out of the classroom for a day, two hour journey there, two hour journey back. And so there were some real opportunities for thinking about the ways that we could achieve the goals of the trust, i.e. improving capacity and improving the ability of teachers and practitioners and support staff to work better. Um, and do that in a way that enhance some of the work that, that we've heard from, from founders and, and involving platforms. That involved um, lots of learning and lots of new things that perhaps we hadn't touched on before. So our way of doing it was via platforms. Um, so we looked at using Microsoft Teams across our schools to develop subject learning communities. So in a way to bring together different uh, uh, teachers and practitioners in a digital space, some of which would be synchronous and live, so they'd have time meeting each other uh, live online but also in some ways that would be asynchronous. So we were trying to create spaces using the technology that people had adopted and, and taken during the course of the pandemic um, in order for them to do things like be able to moderate together, be able to respond to policy together, be able to share student work across, across uh, different schools in a way that might have been really difficult before, but was now possible with technology. 
in terms of that that journey, obviously you, you can imagine the 2020 to 2021 school year in English schools was was very constrained and there was lots of chaos um, in spite of being kind of out of that emergency uh, COVID period. But I think there are lots of things that we can take from, from the, the conjunction between enterprise and education that are really helpful when we think about integrating these things within public institutions. So one thing that I've taken previously from, from work in enterprise and, and has been reiterated I think a lot here is the idea of learning from data and getting feedback in the moment really quickly. And one thing that was really important to us was combining what we knew academically about principles of online learning. So where does CPD work best for adults? In what context? What, what are some of the key principles there? But also then understanding that the context of our schools were likely going to be different because we were in 2021 and, and in pandemic mode, but also that they might naturally be detached from the theory. So it was being able to combine these two things of thinking about the academic and the theory and combining that with doing lots of learning um, from the teachers, from the practitioners, getting feedback about the things we were doing um, and trying to improve how we did things in that sense. And I think there's, there's, there's a real space, certainly in, in public institutions, for that idea of taking a very closed feedback loop, quick iterations and improvement and, and lots of feedback to improving what we do, especially when it moves into new spaces um, such as, as digital. Um, another thing that we learn and I think is, is really important that we all bear in mind when we're thinking about our journeys within EdTech is that lots of the work to be successful in the school had to sit within the system of the school. So it was no good us coming from the outside and suggesting uh, and something to implement on top of what already existed in schools. We had to think about ways that we could use these digital platforms within the school system um, in order to be successful. So for example, where were the spaces and times that practitioners could have time in order to interact and use uh, the platforms that they were a part of? Uh, how could we make sure that the platforms and the CPD that was provided or the CPD was encouraged was linked to the curriculum and what would be going on in the classroom? Um, lots of questions that I think we need to take forward with us. Um, so, yeah, in, in terms of the panel talk, I might be able to touch more on some of the work uh, in India and where we, we scaled up some, some low technology uh, work in education. But I also think it's worth us bearing in mind when we think about the impact that, that EdTech will have to think of that within public institutions and, and the challenges that we might face. I'm trying to put my light back now. Excellent, thank you, Adam. So you touched on um, one of the questions that was asked for all the panelists earlier, but um, I'll, I'll open that question back up and um, ask, is it, is it mostly research skills and experiences that, that you're utilizing whenever you're, you're iterating these drafts or is it just it being a research-based idea? So in those iterations, are there any types of other um, data skills specifically that are being used? Our project, if, if uh, you want me to answer, our, our project is all about data. And so what we've done is integrated with um, the DFE's approved API integration tool from MIS uh, wand. And it, that enables us to, uh, for industry, to access G GDPR compliant data, um, uh, to access um, socioeconomic deprivation um, data by postcode. So it means that um, universities, potentially employers can actually see who, um, what type of uh, user is, is actually accessing and what the talent pipeline and appetite looks like for different sectors. So we can actually forecast what uh, the talent pipeline looks for a region for construction, for example, in 10 years, 20 years time. Nice, thank you, Sarah. Yeah, and I, I, think, I think my response would be yes to both parts of the question. It'd be similar to, to some of the respondents earlier. I think, um, a culture of research skills um, is important and a culture of one that's evidence-led and feedback driven is important and can be applied in lots of different ways right like it looks very different in an enterprise and quick iteration context to, to what it might in a PhD thesis but at the same time I, uh, our work in India for example is very much based on uh, a recent born out of a research idea right so having a look at, at where research might exist uh, in one context and how it could be applied in another as a starting point for what we do, uh, not just as something that then informs how we do it, but actually a starting point as, as well as the culture with it. Excellent, thank you, Adam. So um, 
similar to that, a question that was asked earlier for all panelists, um, how do you see the impact of your projects that you worked on um, impacting future, I'm adding word, future educational research? So if there are any educational researchers out there, what could you tell them from your, your own projects that would be useful? For I'm happy to answer that, but is that the most recent speakers or the session A speakers? Um, I, I, I believe that's for the for the, the session B, but if, if, if there, there still is extra room, we have extra time going. So I'm, I'm open personally to everyone contributing. So hop in. <laughs> I'll wait until session B speakers have spoken. I mean, I, I'm happy to, 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 pick, to, pick this, to pick this up in, in two ways. Um, I think firstly, there, there always needs to be thought when we think about edtech tools that are in, expected to work in the classroom about what the reality is of implementation. Um, how do we need to train teachers? How do we take teachers uh, with very varying levels of digital literacy? Are we producing something that's just based for teachers or is also uh, for support staff? And thinking really hard about what the implementation looks like uh, in the classroom. Um, and I think that's something that's, that's, that's specific to things that work inside schools, but is something that perhaps is, is easy to forget about or not to think about, but actually in terms of a scalable implementation is something that's, that's, that's really important. Um, And, and I think I think I think yeah that 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 covers that. So I'm just reading the new questions as they're they're popping up. Here we have a um, question for Sarah and Adam. So um, here's um, the specific part for Sarah. So the the. Questioners ask, is wondering if developing experts can elaborate on what this would mean in practice and the benefit to users. So the and the in the role of data and the feedback loop. So what could that mean for in practice and benefit to users? Um, to users, um, not a great deal, if I'm honest with you. Uh, it's more to do with government. So we are actually selling our solution into local authorities, into central government, and to sector bodies. Um, so this is all about uh, in it, it helping them understand uh, what the appetite is for a sector and what they need to do to bolster a campaign if there is um, not enough talent going into a specific sector. Um, and so the end user, um, how we um, just increase uh, their experience when they're onboarding. We're in the process of launching some new, new tools, but we actually try to uh, segment our user audience as much detail as possible. So it means that if you're a job seeker or a, a career starter or a career changer, how we collect that data then enables us to push more aligned uh, jobs that match your um, interests and appetite and uh, what your aspirations are. So we use data like that for our end users. Thank you. And then um, Adam, so similarly, um, you, you did touch on this, but if you'd like to tell more about the, the how you've used the feedback loop in the, in the projects that you've worked on. I, yeah, I mean, I, I think in really simple ways, right? Like um, being aware that we aren't the end user um, and so certainly when, when we think about teachers over the course of the last year, getting regular feedback from them about, is this a, a good way to use your time? How could we be doing this better? Um, just being, being really simple and, and a bit crude about it, lots of Google Forms, lots of informal conversations, making sure we share that data as quickly as possible with all the people who might need to know it, and just building a, a general culture of information sharing and making decisions where we're testing our own assumptions. If it's a colleague, for example, well, I used to be in a classroom and this was how it is, so I'm sure the teachers will see it to think the same thing, making sure we test that because, because the landscape the landscape is always changing and especially in last year has been doing so very quickly. Excellent. So um, I'm just conscious of, of time. We, we do have a, a bit of time left. Ryan, I'm wondering if we could pick up the second question. I, I think it looks interesting for me. And, and yeah, uh, the, the, the questions about um, uh, the digitally excluded in society mm -hmm. and how we overcome um, that, that as an issue. And it's something I'd like to talk to perhaps on a global scale and other people might have more local perspectives. Um, but this is, this is something when we think about the people who might benefit from some of the uh, opportunities of education, 
people affected by the climate crisis, internally displaced people. These, in many situations, could be people who face the most exclusion to uh, accessing digital solutions or have barriers they need to overcome. And, and so th there's lots of trends, in, including work that people like Kevin and other people within the faculty are involved in at the moment, which is similar to our work in India, which is about using low tech solutions to enable access by, by, by as great a proportion of people as possible. And it's not um, a one size fits all solution, but I think thinking carefully about when, when we're looking at solutions to ed tech, who we want them to be applicable to, and actually whether, whether the best solution is one that's more high tech, or whether we need to be thinking about bringing barriers down by getting the fundamental principles of, of education design, learning design right, and doing it in a way that's low tech and scalable, um, that could perhaps be what's what's most influential and has and has the best marginal impact on on certainly certain parts of the or certain proportions of the global society. Yeah, other we, people we, might have. Yeah, oh, no, we've. Um, yeah, I mean, we we deal and and work with loads of teachers, uh, and at the moment. Um, majority of the kids who are accessing lessons remotely are doing so through mobile phones. So we know, because um, there's so many kids with mobile phones, we know that lots of kids that are hard to reach are just not going to be able to access our solution. We have, however, um, started to engage with a company over in India um, and with the Gates Foundation, who have a program out in India again, um, that is looking at how to deliver offline solutions for three to six year olds in science across the across the country. Um, and that's, you know, if you look at the infrastructure beyond the cities, there is just no internet. So unless there is, um, unless you're actually delivering your program through an offline solution in third world countries, the assumption is you're just not gonna reach the hard to reach. Looking through the questions, there's a few um, personal questions that I see that um, some of the, the panelists are responding to typing. Thank you for, for those. Um, Maybe I have a last question. If, do we still have time, or can I? Yeah, so we we still have um, time. Because um, I, I mean, I, I like, I'm pretty interested as well because the uh, I think we found this when we scaled Corojo that I had a very like first world viewpoint of like coding and, and digital literacy, which was like making websites, and like I was familiar with like how to use a cursor and like Windows on a like the windowing system and computer, whatever. And then encountering younger people who had used like a desktop computer, they only had like uh, a mobile interface. As Sarah was saying, this is uh, they didn't know about like a file system or you know how files should be relative to each other when making websites or going to other countries where again accessibility was a big issue. So I think the thing that we found was that there was a varying definition of success for the people that we could reach. Sarah's right that there's some people you you can't reach um, if they're they're fully offline. And it does seem to be like a, a weird time culturally where there's a bit of turbulence where you have some people who are like slingshotted into the future and then they have all of these like strange behaviors where uh, um, let's say like the prevalence of like mobile commerce in India where they just skipped a generation of, uh, of e-commerce behavior. But um, yeah, on the, the education front, it seems to be like in maybe some uh, places with, with less accessibility of tech in India, we, we saw Kodoro Joes were actually doing the basics of like computers and, and Boolean logic and circuits. And like, that was the definition of success. Not so much like let's build an iPhone app um, because maybe that's not as successful. Um, I've seen like personally as well with, the, uh, with like an older generation where like the definition of success for technology access is like not getting scammed online with uh, you know with, with these kind of robo calls and then face, fake Facebook accounts and all that. Um, so yeah, it is a uh, it does seem to be one of these problems where you have to uh, have to meet them where they're at um, and try and bring them forward and have varying definitions of success. Um, but it was uh, yeah, I'm, I'm acutely aware that when we started Kodorojo, uh and I, I think that uh, Adam like put it put it great that uh, it was I had a very like egocentric viewpoint on, on what like building technology and technology literacy looked like as a person who grew up in Cork, Ireland. Um, and then there was a lot more empathy that had to be accrued over the years once we saw how other people operated only by getting out there and, and finding out what people had access to. Um, something I'm much more aware of now. I mean, just picking up on the hard to reach element, I mean, it's quite scandalous, um, some of the um, practices I've seen in third world countries where you've got government officials pocketing 
funds and resources that are meant to be going to those hard to reach audiences. Um, I mean, I, I, I went um, to an uh, event uh, that was part of um, uh, pitching to Libya and um, they were just giving examples of uh, how challenging um, the whole um, or lack of infrastructure was because there was a bribe, a culture of bribery. And so what the standard, the standard university age students reading age in Libya is 12 years um, because uh, they actually um, fraudulently bribe the, uh, the assessors for their university entry, entry entrance exams. And so by the time they reach university, you've got this real disconnect between what's on paper and, and what's um uh, and what the reality is so yeah that's just one story which is just multiplied uh, by loads of others so that hard to reach bit um yeah you've got genuine um you know talented young people who are being bypassed in the system by folk who are paying to jump the queue if you like as well which is not great If anyone else would like to um, to wrap up on that question, um, then otherwise we'll have P um, Pablo convening the session for us. Um, hi, thank you. Um, so yeah, so my name is Pablo. I'm a postdoc at the Faculty of Education, and I've just been listening to all you guys very, uh, very passionate uh, entrepreneurs, and I really like all the work you guys are doing. Um, I just find it, you know, fascinating how you can put a personal interest and then just take it forward for so many years um, with such a passion. So yeah, congrats. Um, I think from what I've been listening here, um, it, it looks like you, you start your path uh, from either a personal interest or a need that you clearly see in society. Um, and then you just, you know, hope for the best. Um, and then there's some, yeah, there's some use of, of data to like, deliver the service, if you like, when you have a product. Uh, and there's some level of data, maybe, you know, small amounts of data that you use to, to improve your product. Um, and I, I wonder, you know, how research can be a bigger part of these kind of businesses models, you know? Um, I mean, you are the best people to tell us researchers, I think, where research would fit best. Um, because as a researcher from the research world, very interested in, you know, in new products and promoting things that work and are effective, uh, we have no idea about how to run a business, right? <laughs> so the, the links between the business and the research people um, seem to be much in need. Uh, from what I've been listening, um, you know, there is a lot of evidence that shows you know, that when you make very specific decisions, you need very, very good data to back up your decision and the, those decisions will be the better uh, you can po po that you can possibly take. Um, so, so I think this on one hand data, this comes from, you know, the, the logs of your, of your softwares and, and then you, you know, you can take decisions that way, but there's another stream of data about your users. Um, you know, I, I really like the examples from, um, from Banjo Robinson, you know, like all the, the, the writings that you could analyze from, from your users, you know, that's, that's real qualitative data uh, for us um, that you can actually use and say, okay, maybe I can start creating this new area of, of, of business because all these children seem to be talking about this particular topic and I'm not including that topic in my, re in my model, right, in my, in my product. Or, or, you know, like if we're talking about professional development, so what are the teachers needing at this moment? You know, like, let's take, you know, what, let's survey the teachers and see what they need now. What all, you know, how, how do they think would be a best way of going forward now that we have a product and we are working as a community, you know, online, synchronous, asynchronous, uh, in asynchronous ways. But, you know, do we need to do a blending thing? Do we need a, you know, synchronous and unsynchronous together? Do I need to work, talk to my colleague that is next door that I never talked to because he's not in the online community, you know? Um, do we need, like, you know, school-based communities or do we need, like, 
you know, country-based communities. What do we need? So all these things are much, to my, to my understanding, things that would, would, be, would rise from more qualitative approaches, if you like, of analysis, rather than you know, using analytics, which are very important, of course. Uh, and maybe it's a stream of, uh, of work that I, I would really like to see flourish in, in among this kind of work. The other, uh, the other comment I had um, is to do with, uh, well, you know, the scalability, of course. All these businesses need to be scalable, right? So, um, and so my question is, um, scalable for what? So is it for engagement or is it for impact and effect? So some of you, you know, you have a very clear target of, you know, promoting literacy or, you know, developing teachers, uh, you know, promoting coding. But are we being effective or like, you know, streaming career choices, uh, engaging children in technology, but are we being effective? So that's the other question, right? So it seems that there's engagement and the engagement can lead to many different paths. Uh, you know, it could be effectively that the children are developing literacy, literacy skills, that that the students are getting streamed into their best career choices. But do we know that? So that's, you know, another kind of question. Um, and can we partner with researchers that maybe can tell us how effective are we being or in what are we having an effect, right? So an, our, an assumption would be that, you know, if my product is working for A, then, you know, and there's engagement that for sure I'm going, I'm, I'm, I'm promoting A, yeah, A skill, a capacity, a etc. But um, but that would be an assumption, right? So we don't know, um, and it would be brilliant to know because the more you know and can prove the effectiveness of your product, the more it's going to be used, right? Um, so yeah, I think um, I like I would like to to maybe ask you guys now in the last five minutes of this event. Um, what do you think about this match between technology, I mean, the research and entrepreneurship and where, where could we work best together? Um, we, Pablo, I can, oh, go yeah, on. Okay, so, yeah, I mean, we are in the process of actually um, uh, finding a university partner to actually embark on a research project because our main, um, our main uh, next audience uh, is to win government contracts. To win a government contract, we need independent impact data to validate the product and the fact that it can work. So we can't just say it's wonderful. So, um, yeah, I, I'll be interested in connecting with the link you've, you've given because it's um, in the next 12 months. That's something we, we're about to embark on. Fantastic. And, and similarly, from our point of view, if there are any linguists, um, certainly people uh, involved in looking at English education, uh, we collect a massive amount of data, uh, basically of voices of voices from different parts of India, um, other contexts in Southeast Asia too. Um, we use those voices um, and send them off to the cloud and they're used for voice to text as part of our asynchronous um, or, or, or synchronous for offline and online learning. But we are creating are collecting lots and lots of data about uh, how children in different parts of the world produce sounds when they're learning English. And at the same time, because of the nature of our, our curriculum, which is which is quite scripts and defined, we're collecting lots of assessment data, uh, generally formative, but some summative too, um, about student performance in learning English. And, and I know the guys would be incredibly happy because uh, part of the medium term goal is absolutely looking at how massive data sets that we're collecting uh, can be used to inform provision about how English teaching can be done best in, in different contexts, where at the moment we might not necessarily have that data. And, One more minute, maybe. Yeah. On that link, um, I guess most of the, the, the KPIs that I've, I've seen in the business setting, it was a, a weird switch after going from like being a socialist with Kodorojo to like the throes of capitalism, but like it's a lot easier because in, in uh, when Kodorojo, our kind of metrics were like, how many children did we inspire? How many lives did we impact? All these ones that are terrible, like difficult to quantify. Whereas like capitalism was like, how much money did we make? Like what's the average order value size? Can we extrapolate that? What's our cost to acquire, cost to acquire a customer? And there's a lot of software for that. So it's, it's pretty easy. Um, so I have found though, that if you if you go below that surface level and, and, and are just not trying to extract as much money from people as possible and quantify that impact, it's a lot more uh, cumbersome. Uh, the methodologies you have to devise seem to be a lot more unique. Um, and there was a lot of effort that was uh, taken in Kodorojo for that. So 
I, I do have an appreciation that it, it's not necessarily a skill set that seems to be in a lot of um, for-profit organizations or maybe organizations who, whose KPIs are, are mostly on the uh, on the profit side. And I do see when it would come to digging down the actual impact on users or people who are using the service and then other things that you wouldn't expect that are kind of beyond some of the, the high level metrics. I'm like, it's great to know that we're, that somebody is using this thing and that they're engaging. And this is the amount of times that we're turning, but what is like the second and third degree effects of it? Um, I think the, the practice and discipline around getting that information, uh, collating it and making it actionable is, uh, there's a huge opportunity for, uh, I guess, for profits or enterprise to engage with researchers on that because that hasn't, in my experience, traditionally been a, a strong suit of, uh, enterprise, they've kind of stayed at like that that first or second level. Um, a lot, a lot of people, some organizations do, but that's where I see a, a real opportunity. Yeah, well, a lot, a lot of room to to grow. Um, so as we bring this session to a close, I, I just, I guess, I'd like to thank you all, um, panelists again. So James Walton, Dina Fajardo Tovar, Kate Boyle, Sarah Minty, Adam Woodich. Um, thank you all for your questions and participation, and. Just so you know, in the chat, we have a link. Um, yeah, in the chat, we have a link to an event survey. We would greatly appreciate your feedback here and um, be sure to follow DEFI so that we can keep you informed about upcoming events and research opportunities throughout 2022. Also, links to our social media channels are in the chat. So without further ado, I just guess uh, I pass it over to Ryan to close up and thank everybody. Yeah, to, again, to reiterate what Pablo said, thank you to all the panelists, the participants. Thank you to the uh, other people who've, who've moderated the event. That It took us a while to have it. We just scheduled it a couple months ago, but we had some issues out of our control. So it's nice to get everyone here together. And I look forward to seeing you all at the next DEFI webinar. Hopefully we'll have something in person in the future. And again, I'll say in person and online, it'll be hybrid. We'll, we'll always leave that option. <laughs> Thank you. Also, let's take this opportunity to invite you all to be part of the research, the DEFI Research Network. So um, this is the enterprise uh, strand. The research network is a bit wider, includes people that work in research exclusively. So if you want to be part of it, just contact DEFI uh, website and yeah, and all the information that is in the chat. Thank you. <laughs>